live? With it? All right, thank you very much. All right, so we are uh, in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 3. Uh, we have talked about the beginning of the church and the establishment of it in A.D. 33. And we've talked about how that the different nations had come in, and you have to understand this being the providence of God, as these different nations uh, were brought to Jerusalem for the feast day, they spoke different languages, although they were still Jews, they still spoke a different language in which they were, the country they were in. Now you have to understand this being the providence of God because it is a means to spread the gospel. So when they hear the gospel and it's preached in their own language, the apostles preach in the, in the language in which they spoke, and when they go back home, they take the gospel with them. So it's kind of like networking. It's kind of like going out. You thought Amway was the first networking? It wasn't. It happened in the second century. And, and this all started 600 years before Christ came into the world. This is how God prepared the establishment of the church and the spreading of the gospel by the fact that he brought the, the Jewish people, the Israelite nation, into captivity because of sin and then held them there 70 years. Then when the Medes and Persians come in and send them home, they all don't go home. They, they're scattered. They're scattered in Rome. They're scattered in Bermithia. They're scattered in Cappadocia. They're scattered at the Medes. They're scattered in di different places of the world. And they're going to live there. They're going to grow their families there. They're going to learn the language there. And when they do that and come back to Jerusalem for the feast day, now they are ready to carry the gospel into the world. You also have to understand there were other events taking place. Not only was it the, the scattering of the Jews through captivity and the release of captivity, but who was in, who was in control of the world at this time? I didn't hear you. Rome. I mean, you're right, Charlie. God is always in control, but Rome is in control. And what are they known for? <laughs> Highways, travel, peace, like Brother Israel and what was set up here. They are made roads, and these roads made travel easy. What used to be a pig trail now is a highway under the Roman things, which made travel easy. And so when these Jews come to Jerusalem, and why did they come to Jerusalem? Because of the Passover, they were required to come. They were required by God to come three times a year. Now they were there at, at the Passover, and it was the first month 14th day, Passover, and then 50 days later you're going to have Pentecost or Old Testament is called what? Feast of Weeks, that's right. So it's seven weeks plus one day and that equals to Pentecost 50, so you got 50 days. So why, why you want to travel over a thousand miles back home when you've got to turn around and be right back there in 50 days. So when they were here in Passover and then the gospel being preached in Pentecost and you've got 17, 15, 17 different nations, they're traveling this way, what's going to happen when they leave? They're going to carry the gospel with them. When we get to Acts 8, and when Saul of Tarsus is persecuting the church, what happens? Acts 8 verse 4. They were scattered, but what did they do when they were scattered? They went everywhere preaching the word. Same thing is going to happen here. So you have to understand that when the Jews went into captivity at 600 B.C., God was preparing for the church 
in 33 A.D. You have to understand that. And you also have to understand that in between the, in between the captivity in Rome in this 600 years, you had two empires that were between those, Persian Empire and then the Grecian Empire. So what were the Greeks known for? World language. You got world travel, you got world language, you got a universal law, world law. You've got all of these things mixed together uh, and God uses those to bring, bring his people together preaching the gospel of Christ and guess what? When they go, they take it with them. When Paul writes to the church at Rome, he had never been to Rome, but the church was already established, right? And it says in Acts 2 that there were there at Pentecost strangers from Rome. So possibly when they went back home, they carried the gospel with them. So that is the beginning of the church. So Acts 3, what is, the, what is Acts 3 about? The progression of the church. Remember the book of Acts is about the church. It's not about Peter, although he was a major role player in the preaching of the gospel. Not about Paul, it's about the church. And here's the beginning of the church, Acts 2. Acts 1 is the preparation of the church, Acts 2. The beginning of the church, Acts 3 and on, is the development of the church. How the church develops. And so now, when, when we begin in Acts chapter 3, the church has already been established. 3,000 had been baptized. But the Bible also says this at the end of Acts. That the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. 3,000 one day, but then it says added daily. Does that mean that more people obeyed the gospel between Acts 2 and Acts 3? Yes, it does. Because when you get, is it Acts 4 where it says there were 5,000 men? Acts 5 says there were the multitudes. The church is beginning to explode. This is not a fad. This is not just something that pops up and people are just excited and giddy about it and then all of a sudden it just the, the, the fizzes out. The church and what Luke is showing us through the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is how that the church is going to develop and how that it explodes. And it goes all the way through the end of Acts 28 and ends with whom? Now if you've been in Israel's class, you'll know who it ends with. Or if you've been in that class, I'm sure you know who it ends with. Who does it end with? Paul in prison. We don't have anything after that. We don't have any inspiration of history of the development of the church after Paul's in prison. Now, through the letters, through John, which has the general epistles, Peter, which has the general epistles, Jude, uh, perhaps even James, these, these are writers that give us some insight of what's going on, but it doesn't tell us of the conversion of this. So when you get to the first, and, the first century, now you have the apostolic fathers. Now, who were they? They, they were behind the apostles. Were they inspired? No. But they did give us insight as to what happened. So now we have the development through secular history of how the church began to develop after 100 A.D. And even through the time of, of uh, well, you can go all the way through, through now, but the development of the church and what happened to Christians. Now, this is secular. It is not inspired, but it does give us a little insight of what happens. So we have the, the motivation and the preaching of the gospel and the preparation for it by God, and it comes in, and then it just literally explodes. And the thing about Christianity... The thing about Christianity under the days of the Roman Empire, if you, ha if you uh, the, under the Roman Empire, they worshiped these 
various idols, and they were lo locative idols. In other words, this idol was particular to this community, and there was a different idol that was particular to this community. But they all worshipped the, the god like Zor and, and uh, Thor and these other Zeus. There were the major gods, but then there were these little gods. But here's the problem that those individuals that would go to those shrines and worship those idols had to pay an extreme amount of money in order to be a part of it. So it really came down to the rich. Now, now people would, would buy these little shrines, and when they'd go on vacation, they'd, they'd stop and they'd take a shrine out and they'd set it up, and they'd burn incense to it or burn sacrifice to it and worship that way. Uh, that's the way that they worship. But when Christianity comes into play, it literally exploded because it had an appeal to the poor because they didn't have to dish out a lot of money to be a Christian. Uh, you have to give them the first day of the week, understand that. But you didn't have to pay a high premium in order to, to serve God. You, you, and so this was appealing. Now, I'm not talking about things that are found in the scriptures. I'm talking about it from a secular point of view. So you've got these things, and all of these factors are, are driving the gospel. Now the appeal is forgiveness of sin. That's the appeal. We now have forgiveness of sin that is in Christ Jesus. The Roman gods never promised to forgive any sins. And then, of course, under the law of Moses, there was no provision for the forgiveness of sins. So here's God offering the forgiveness of sins through his son who died. And, and these are motivating factors that causes the, the church to grow. And one more factor, and I talk about it all the time, you may get sick of it. But that other factor is what? You know what I'm talking about? The other factor that drove Christianity to the world? Persecution. The Jews persecuted the Christians, got it out of Jerusalem. Once it got out of Jerusalem, then the Romans picked up. And when the Romans would persecute the Christians, it would get them out of those cities. And it was just like throwing water on a grease fire. I mean, the, the church exploded. It's, it's pretty amazing. when you There's several books that you may be interested in reading just for the history of it. One of them is called How the Romans Viewed Christianity. And they hated Christians and they despised them because Christians wouldn't bow to their gods, wouldn't bow to the God that would protect the garden, the God that protect the home, and the God, the God of darkness and all of this. They would not burn incense. Rome didn't care what gods you followed but you better pay obeisance to, to Rome, to, to the emperor. That's what they cared about. But Christians not only wouldn't fall to paganism, to those idols, they didn't, they didn't bow to Rome. They did not bow to the emperors. And that's what caused that persecution. It drove them, the Christians underground, and when it drove them underground, the Romans would be more suspicious, they couldn't look at a person and say, well, he is a Christian because he didn't wear anything special. And they didn't worship in temples. They could look at a Jew or a person under the law of Moses and say, well, that person worships under the law of Moses. There's his temple. Look at that priest. Look at his clothing. Look what he wears. You can't do that. You couldn't look at a man and say, well, is he an elder of the church? Is he a Christian? Because he didn't wear anything special. And that's what drove the persecution for these Romans. Now, was that the providence of God? I believe it was. I believe it was. In fact, Paul says, Yea, all those who would live godly shall suffer persecution. Is that what it says? 2 Timothy 3, 12. Peter says, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. What's what he says? Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him glorify God on this behalf. 
Peter talked about the suffering. Peter talked about the persecution. He says, you bear it up. You look at it like you're suffering with Christ. And of course, that was, these were motivating factors that, that drove Christianity. All right, so we're in chapter 3 of Acts. I know I gave you a lot of history, and you probably already knew that. I didn't probably have to tell you that. But the thing is, it is the development of the church. And when you look at how the church developed and how it began and how it continued, you have to understand that this is all through the providence of God. When the miracles were performed, what did it do? It confirmed that messenger. He's a man of God. Every word that comes out of his mouth is true. God confirmed them with miracles. And so now Peter, the church has been established. 3,000 have been baptized. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That is, that they, there are more people joining themselves becoming Christians. So now Peter and John are going to the temple. We read, I think we have read that. But for what reason do they go to the temple? Well, the hour of prayer. They went at uh, generally in the morning or at noon, actually at noon time, and then of course the evening prayer uh, being about the ninth hour. So that's about three o'clock in the afternoon. So they, there was this time of prayer. Now you have to remember that they did this all the time. And when the hour of prayer came, when the hour of prayer came, it brings the people together. It brings them together. And it's an opportunity to preach. Is that correct? All right, so Peter and John going up to the temple to pray, being the ninth hour, there is opportunity here. Well, let me just get over there. I have to figure out what page that's on. Happy Mark, we can find it. That's the only way I remember, you know. What, what page is it? You know I'm being funny. Waste the time. Now, Peter and John, verse 1, chapter 3. Now, Peter and John went up to the temple to, to pray at the ninth hour of prayer. You know, that is going to be a busy time. That is when people come. They want to hear the prayers of the priest. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried by whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, in which called beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Now remember this. We already mentioned this. Under the law of Moses, a man who was crippled, a man who had a birth defect, anything, could not go into the temple. Now when we say into the temple, you have to remember he is not talking about the inner sanctuary. You've got the most holy place here. You've got the holy place here. You've got the uh, altar of incense here. You've got the candlestick here. You've got the table of showbread here. You're supposed to have the Ark of the Covenant uh, here, but it's not here. It's gone. It's disappeared. Israel, I told them that Nebuchadnezzar got a hold of it. I don't know what you think of that. Well, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar got a hold of it and melted it down. You've got a laver here. That's where the priests had to wash to go in. The only people that were allowed in here were the priests. The common man was not allowed in here. Not even a Levite. He had to be a priest. Now a priest was a Levite, but not all Levites were priests. Priest, only priest, and only high priest could go in here. So when they say that they were about to enter to the temple, Peter and John are not Levites. But they can go into the courtyards. And, of course, as we mentioned, these were often separated out. you got a court of the Gentiles. you got court of the women. you got different courts, and, and birds of a feather flock together. Sadducees may be in one place, Pharisees in another place, Essenes in one place, common people in here. Women would gather here. And, and so when they would enter in here and listen to the prayers on Solomon's porch, it was a time where people came together. People depended on prayer in that day and time. 
not like they do today, do they? I mean, we depend on prayer. But it was an opportunity for, for the gospel to be preached because here's a man laying here. He could not go in here. He couldn't go in there. He would be outside, and what do we know about him? He was laying for how long? From birth, and they laid him at the gate. He didn't walk up to the gate, uh, you know, and was in a wheelchair or crutches. They took him and they laid him here. Why? Pretty good opportunity to collect money, isn't it? Because, you know, this is a place where people are going to, to get close to God. So this man begging, he had pretty good opportunity here. So y'all understand that, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, what happened, well, yeah, that's a good point. What happened was you had Solomon's temple, right? It was destroyed. Solomon's temple was destroyed, and it was small, very small. So back around 400 B.C., a little bit before that, probably 516, 516, Zerubbabel, the governor of the land, comes in, and he and Ezra established worship, or actually Ezra established worship, was Zerubbabel, he builds the Zerubbabel's temple. Zerubbabel's temple survives all the way through, the, he, he builds after the captivity, this is destroyed in captivity, the temple laid waste 70 years, so this temple is being built after they have uh, come back from captivity, but during this time, you have the intertestament time. And we don't have a lot of information through the Bible about the intertestament time. We have the book of Maccabees. You had 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and 4th Maccabees, and they were combined into two. And they are not inspired, but they are history. So we can kind of count on that as history. A man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes came, comes into Jerusalem and he is riding on elephants and his whole crowd is coming in on elephants and they're going to, they're going to destroy Jerusalem again. In the intertestament period, it had already been destroyed in about 587 B.C. It was rebuilt by Neb uh, uh, Nehemiah in about four. 444, is that right? 444 B.C., Nehemiah has the walls erected. So from 400 B.C. to 0 or 1 A.D., in that intertestament period, Antiochus Epiphanes comes in about 165, and he is going to tear Jerusalem up. The problem is he couldn't do it, and he did a lot of damage. He, he killed a pig, he took the guts, and he slung it all over Zerubbabel's temple. And the Jews fought back, and they won. I'll tell you the story about uh, uh, the Maccabees. The Maccabees were very instrumental in protecting Jerusalem. Uh, and one of them, I can't remember his name, he's called the Elephant Sticker, and I've told you this story as uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and his crews coming in on these elephants, uh, this guy and his last name, Maccabees, runs up to this elephant and sticks him with a spear. Well, when he does that, that elephant falls on him and kills him, and he gets the name, the elephant sticker. But here's the thing. They were able to keep Antiochus from destroying Jerusalem again. And so in 90 B.C., 90 B.C., Herod comes in and he starts to rebuild the damage that was here. And he begins to add on and add on and add on and add on and add on. And it goes from the Herods from 90 B.C. to, to 70 A.D., were continually building on the temple, repairing it, 
building porches, making gates. And so all of this stopped right here. So what happens here? It got destroyed by Rome. So you, and that's a good point what Brother Israel said, because Zerubbabel's temple, by the time we get to Jesus, it's called whose temple? Herod. Why? Because he's done all this remodeling. He's done all of this remodeling. And it, it is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so in Matthew 24, when the apostle Jesus says, you see these, you see this temple? All these stones are going to be thrown to the ground. Well, Lord, tell us when these are going to be. And so Jesus begins to tell of the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem and uses the prophecy of Daniel, uses Daniel's prophecy to warn these Christians. And so the temple is destroyed in 70 A.D. Now, when was Jesus crucified? 33 A.D. So you've got that period of about 37 years of Jerusalem, which that gives the church an incubation period, and, and the church begins to grow and grow and scatter and grow. And when it does, the Jews are persecuted, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, they begin to persecute these Christians. They get out of Jerusalem, get into these other cities. Rome takes up. And, and so the, this is continually growing. This is continually building an incubation period. By the time they get out of Jerusalem, then here comes Titus, who is Vespasian's son, comes in there, given the order. Vespasian gives the order. He's the emperor. Tells his son Titus, destroy Jerusalem. How long was Titus out here before that they destroyed Jerusalem? You remember? Two years. He circled two years around Jerusalem. And that was a warning to the Christians. Jesus says, if you own the rooftop, don't come down. Go down by the wall. Pray that they don't lock the gates on the Sabbath day. Pray that a woman is not pregnant when she's fleeing to the mountains. And so, in fact, you have one taken and one remains. What does that mean? Well, when the Romans come in there, they're taking slaves, they're killing people. It doesn't mean the rapture. You know, it doesn't mean that you're going to be driving down 59 and all of a sudden the driver in the next car is going to disappear. That ain't what he's talking about. That's the silliest thing I ever heard in my life. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and how that it's going to take place, and how that these Christians are going to see the signs, there is when they hear wars and rumors of war, where Titus would already surround them. They've heard these earthquakes. That doesn't mean literally an earthquake. It means there is this rumbling that's coming around. They're coming in, and they are going to destroy Jerusalem. Because Vespasian is fed up with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and the Zealots. He is fed up with them. They're nothing but troublemakers. And the Christian says, I see you. And they took off. And so when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, not a single Christian died. Not a single Christian died in Jerusalem. Because they listened to Jesus and they read the prophecies of Daniel. So the point is, this, you know, we, Israel makes a good point about the, the, the temple. And the temple, as we mentioned, was the center of the culture. It was the center. It was their identity. When they didn't have the temple, when Solomon was destroyed, it lost their ident identity. And they were scattered and they went into captivity. When they rebuilt it, Zerubbabel rebuilt it. There Zerubbabel rebuilds it, and then they was having a problem sacrificing. Malachi has to write them a letter. There's a reason why, you, reason why you're poor, reason why your sheep is not breeding. The reason why you're planting corn and not getting corn is because you're not giving to the Lord. That's why. Will a man rob God? 
Well, I can't, Lord, I'm poor. I just came back from captivity. Uh, I can give you this blind sheep. Malachi said, that ain't good enough. You don't give that. You don't pay your taxes with that. What makes you think the Lord's going to accept it? So the point is that here is the tabernacle, uh, the, the temple. And the temple was the, the brought them together. After, after Nehemiah built the walls, the temple had already been built. And they were, when they got it finished, we're looking at about 400 B.C. So 400 B.C. to 1 A.D., Jerusalem has to be up and running and functioning. They have to be doing business there. They have to be doing worship there. They have to be burning sacrifices there. Their priests have to be active there because the Messiah is coming. And so it takes 400 years for, for that to take place. And by the time when they get things going and by the time Jesus comes into the world, Jerusalem is where it is supposed to be in its place of worship, its place of prayer. It's, the priesthood is going to be there. The Jews are going to be elated because it had been destroyed and now they're happy, so they travel from Rome. They travel from Bethina. They travel from the Medes. They travel from Arabia. And they come to Jerusalem on uh, the Passover to see a man die, hang on a cross, who said he's innocent. And then 58 days later, they're preaching his resurrection and preaching how this was God's plan. God's plan all along to bring the Messiah into the world. So chapter 3, we have the progression of the church and how it is developing and how that it is growing. And you have to remember, all of this is working to spread the gospel into all the world and come up to 2022. The reason why we are here serving God it's because of this, because of what God has done in the past. Now, I'm not saying a miraculous thing happened. I'm saying this is the providence of God, and God planned all of this, and the gospel being preached, and so here is the gospel as it is preached and unveiled, the Son of God. Yes. Yeah, there, it's inspired. Brother Sewell said it's, in, it's recorded perfectly. It's inspired. We don't have to say, well, that's Josephus writing and he was prejudiced or this was somebody else's writing. This is, this is Luke's writing. He was a physician. God chose him to, to write this and this is perfect. It's complete. It's all that we need. Yeah, Israel. Yeah, Israel. Yes, exactly. If God planned it and designed it, and all of this has been done hundreds, if not thousands of years, and actually you can say it began in the days of Adam, and you, you're talking about the thousands of years, 4,000 years between Adam and Christ, and all of this was work, you can see how every step is, is the providence of God. And the design, as Brother Israel said, what gives me the right to change it? Yes. 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 Uh, Brother Sewell was talking about how that it was laid before the foundation of the world. Is ever the church was ever in the mind of God? And when you get to the book of Ephesians and says that we were predestined. It doesn't mean that God said, I'm going to pick you to be saved, and I'm going to pick you to be lost, and I'm going to pick you to be saved, and you to be saved, and you to be lost. When he says that we are predestined, what he says is that God predetermined to save all of those that are in Christ. That's what he said. Exactly right. Uh, another interesting, story, uh, interesting study is premillennialism and the, the doctrine of uh, predestination. Uh, and you could just, 
you, all you do need to do is take the Bible and you can pick it to pieces because it is not true. It's not true. God did not choose to save one man and say, this other man, you're lost. He's no respect or person. God chose to save all of those that are in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you're not going to be saved. That's just, that's just how plain it is. So, any other comment? Any other question? Boy, that's beautiful, ain't it? It's God's plan. Uh, you know, the design is, that's, that's my, I taught art in kindergarten one time, but that's it. So, uh, anyway. So, when we see the lame man sitting at the gate, this is also a means to, to bring people together for the purpose of preaching the gospel. The sound of a mighty rushing wind in Acts 2 brought everybody together. The lame man here in chapter 3 is going to bring people together when he is healed. We've already been told he was lame from his mother's birth and they had to carry him to the temple and they had to lay him at the gates. 40 years old and you don't think that every day when they pass by and this guy say alms, alms, alms that they didn't know who he was? That's old what's his name? That's old Joseph and Joseph he's, you know, he'd been laying there for a long time and then when he, uh, you know, Peter says this, uh, verse 3, who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple ask for alms, money, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter says, silver and gold do I not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Wait a minute, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is that? It's the person you crucified 50 days before this. That's who he is. When they said Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they knew exactly who it was. They knew exactly that he was the one that was hanging on that cross. They knew that he was the one who, who was, was kept uh, to be put to death and a murderer was released. And that's what it's going to say in the text here. Right? Uh, Peter's laying it on him. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaped up. Wait a minute, this guy had been lame from his mother's birth and stood and walked and entered the temple with them. Now he could go into the temple. Leaping and jumping. I mean, uh, you know, you see kids running around, jumping up and down, everything else. Here's a guy that uh, you don't think everybody could fix their eyes on him, didn't know who he was. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Well, I guess so. I mean, you've been crippled from your mother's birth. Now you have are healed. You got any better than anything that alms could give you. And they knew that it was he who sat begging at alms at the gate, a beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So what did this miracle do? It brings the people together. They are filled with amazement. How is this? How can this be? Here's a man crippled. I was in Russia, and I'm, I think I've told this story. I was in Russia back in 93, 94, but we went into this place, this place that were cooking food so that we hadn't, we hadn't had anything to eat in about two days. We were in Mos uh, Mormonts. But anyway, this guy, he was, lay, uh, he was sitting at the door uh, when you go in, and he had his hand out, and everybody, and people were going in and out, and he was begging money, and and that's what this reminds me of. This guy, uh, the, when I saw him, he was a, in very, a very pitiful state. I mean, it was, you couldn't help but feel sorry for him, uh, have compassion on him. And, of course, you know, we were able to help him a little bit, but, you know, he, he, uh, he's just lying there. But now here's one that they recognize every day, going to the temple, into the hour of prayer, 
Every day, every day was the hour of prayer. Every day they walked by him. They knew who he was. And he says in verse 11, And now the lame man who was healed on the, uh, held on to Peter and John, and all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. When Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? So what does Peter do? He said, why are you looking at us? We didn't do this. Who did this? Jesus did it. And the very point is that the Jesus who did this you have held and he was crucified and you turned a murderer loose. So anyway, all right. So I, I know we didn't get very far, but I just, the history of this, I think it really makes a big difference as our, in our understanding as this is just, this is no ordinary story. This is no ordinary book. 